Hi, everybody. <laughs> I love being in a room where no one is here to see me. <laughs> um, probably, I don't know if anyone aside from Fred and Jericho know this, but this is the first time that they've actually been in a dialogue together. Um, <laughs> Fred, we love he you made, dearly. He, he made a face like I could have went a little longer. <laughs> Fred, Fred is is not well enough to travel, but he agreed to be with us virtually, and um, we are so sad you're not with us in person, but really excited that you're with us virtually. So, hello, Fred. Can we hear you? I I hope so. Yes, we um, can hear you. Great, great. Um, I'm glad to be there virtually if that's the only way it could be i'm sorry i can't be there in person <laughs> um so we're here for a conversation about black poetics and the early modern connections or disconnects how sonnets or any other thing fit into your work i'll very briefly introduce our speakers who don't really need any introduction uh, by the way i'm ayana thompson i'm a regents professor in the department of english and the director of the arizona center for medieval and renaissance studies welcome everybody <laughs> fred moton is a cultural theorist and poet creating new conceptual spaces that accommodate emergent forms of black cultural production, aesthetics, and social life. In his theoretical and critical writing on visual culture, <laughs> Jericho's got friends in the room, <laughs> sorry. Uh, in his theoretical and critical writings on visual culture, poetics, music, and performance, Moten seeks to move beyond normative categories of analysis grounded in Western philosophical traditions that do not account for the black experience, as we've been talking about all day today. He is developing a new mode of aesthetic inquiry wherein the conditions of being black play a central role. Welcome, Fred. And Jericho Brown is the recipient of the Whiting Writers Award and fellowships from the American Academy, sorry, the Academy of American Poets, the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, and the National Endowment for the Arts. He is also the author of many books, including the collection The Tradition from 2019, which was a finalist for the 2019 National Book Award. Oh, and the winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. <laughs> poetry. <laughs> he is the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Creative Writing and the Director of the Creative Writing Program at Emory University in Atlanta. Welcome, Fred and Jericho. So we were going to start with some poems. I can't remember who was going to go first. I, I, I'm sure I should. I don't want to get upstaged. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jericho's going to go first. I was already, um, I was really ready to read y'all some poems. And then Rita Dove walked in the room and I got nervous. <laughs> uh, my Lord in heaven. Uh, so I'll read you um, a poem that somehow in my mind is influenced by the Fairy Queen. And then I'll read you um, some duplexes. The duplex is a form that I invented that is a sonnet and a huzzle and the blues. Sitcom. Oh, I should say, this is a poem about a, a, a television sitcom that was on in the late 70s and the early 80s, and it was called The Jeffersons. Um, <clears throat> this, this poem is about a particular episode of The Jeffersons that um, I think I thought about every day my entire life um, from the first time I saw it. Some of you will remember the episode um, and some of you will think that it sounds so ridiculous that it couldn't happen. So I implore you to go check it out. Sitcom. A rabbit tried to kill Louise once when I was a kid. 
I'm saying Louise now, but I'd have said Miss Louise then as she appeared on our screens once a week wearing blues I haven't seen since. Her long hair curled, combed out, and pushed up into a volume so thick you felt both the power of an afro and the requirement of a relaxer on a woman rounder than most of her penthouse neighbors. Hair that wouldn't move no matter how much she shook when she yelled at her husband or when trapped by a man dressed as a rabbit who wielded a snub-nosed 38 special we thought scary before we knew what an AR-15 could do. Miss Louise never sang, but she had a voice that left you wondering how singing might sound on her. She was that beautiful and dark. They had a grown son. She wasn't a young woman. By the time I saw the Halloween rerun, the youngest men in my hometown had organized themselves into colors, red and blue. They were patriots. Like patriots, they'd shoot, and they'd shoot each other too. They'd shoot you if you accidentally scuffed their shoes at a club or a concert. They'd shoot driving from their cars into houses and parks. They'd sell you something so good you'd sell our TV to get more of it. And I cannot say I didn't love them. They killed my first girlfriend, a straight bullet meant for her brother, and I loved them. They killed my cousin, but some of them were my other cousins, and I still loved us in all my fear of our gold teeth and oversized dickies. They'd kill me today, yet remain a problem I mean to solve. I'm grown now. I know Louise was the star of the show, the leading lady. No writer would kill her off on a sitcom. Murder is meant for real life. Anybody can get a gun, but nobody kills Louise Jefferson. There is a place where black people don't die, a deluxe apartment in the sky. All week I worried about the next episode. Mornings I dress myself and my little sister, making sure we wore nothing that looked like the flag. And when the appointed night fell, the jokes were still funny. The rabbit apprehended. The white rabbit didn't murder the black lady. No, not on TV. I, really, I hadn't planned this, but I'll read the tradition just because everybody in Atlanta um, been told to board up their houses and lock their doors in case something should happen this evening after the showing of this video. The tradition, Aster, Nasturtium, Delphinium, we thought fingers in dirt meant it was our dirt, learning names in heat, in elements classical philosophers said could change us. Stargazer, foxglove, summer seemed to bloom against the will of the sun, which news reports claimed flamed hotter on this planet than when our dead fathers wiped sweat from their necks. Cosmos, baby's breath, Men like me and my brothers filmed what we planted for proof we existed before too late. Sped the video to see blossoms brought in seconds, colors you expect in poems where the world ends, everything cut down. John Crawford, Eric Garner, Mike Brown. So I hadn't planned to read that, but that's a sonnet, so I guess y'all take it. Um, just two more, and they're short. One second. <laughs> Duplex. I begin with love. 
hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. And I'll finish with a, um, a poem. Um, I mentioned to you that the form of the duplex um, makes it at um, nine to 11 syllables a line, a sonnet, a hustle, and a, a blues poem. Uh, it's also, uh, this particular poem adds a layer of form as it is also a cento. As you know, a cento uh, takes all of its lines from other poems, usually by other poets. This one is a little different as it is completely made up of the lines from all the other duplexes in the book. Because I'm a nerd. <laughs> Duplex, cento. My last love drove a burgundy car, color of a rash, a symptom of sickness. We were the symptoms, the road, our sickness. None of our fights ended where they began. None of the beaten end where they begin. Any man in love can cause a messy corpse but I didn't want to leave a messy corpse obliterated in some lilied field. Stench obliterating lilies of the field. The murderer young and unreasonable. He was so young, so unreasonable, steadfast and awful, tall as my father. Steadfast and awful, my tall father was my first love. He drove a burgundy car. Thank you all. Could we get some water, please? Uh, some staff from ACMRS, could we get them some water? Um, Fred, are you able, willing and able to read a few poems and then we'll talk? Um, yes. I try to finish as soon as I can. <laughs> so uh, I usually don't get trapped trying to follow behind great poets, but you know, you, you caught me this time. So <laughs> I'll get off the stage as quickly as I can. And I, I have a, I have one that's kind of influenced, I guess, by the Fairy Queen too. So I'll start with that, and then. Um, and then I, I wrote a, a kind of broken sonnet sequence, I guess, called I Ran From It But Was Still In It. And I'll read three of those. Um, okay, so this is called The Fairy Ornithology. The fairy ornithology of Fumi's dancing branches feels the non-sensuous feel of feeling depth, the range of fringe or frill the trill that various change of direction makes in murmurs various gathering of breeze. The tinge of various turn in murmur, nonsense. Blue fascinums return to exodus, unvoid or atom. Not between bird and all the various indecision. For there is nothing lost that may be found if sought is neither here nor there in tide and flight, array, repose, and tarry. And then um, these are from, uh, I ran from it, but was still in it. I come from around to just above Angola, escape. Song is homeless for running away inside. Make us clear the stumps and squats and raise shit up on a brutal echoed bottom. 
We don't feel comfortable till we step and till in them public private clubs. Then the fish scent hit the air that we turn over. Then we take the latest thing up to being back new things. Then move secret in the city that repeated every time we come and send. Then curve the gated embouchure and a key made out of combs to amuse you with flavor. Then solfege at the poor theater. Then reels, but for real, we don't play, but curl up in boxes. I like to enjoy myself. I enjoyed you, Fred, because we tell stories, because we live in common every night, live in Stockholm, the secret acceleration of a thousand years on the road till the particles collide and cry on the bridge between CERN and Fermilab as sacred means. The theory of enjoyment is in repose, rubbing the history of broken veins and towels wore down the velvet. The theory of enjoyment puts itself in danger to remain still as a part of breath while the sails glide. When you can't do no better, the feeling of the theory of enjoyment is solid. The experiment of the ones who live to eat enormously. I am foment. I speak blinglish. At work they call me, but I don't come. I come when she call me, but my rightful name. I come to myself from far away, just laid back in the open. I ran from it and was still in it. It's a blue division on my goodbye window. I'm full of outer space. I'm free as dread all night. I get clung with a voice that gets held back by surge protection. I'm daddy. I come when he crazy. He call me, I'm crazy. I come when he called me once upon a time in Arkansas. When the water come, I come to the unprotected surge and division in my old new sound booth. I am F. Mo. That's it. So I had asked you both to think a little bit about how early modern poetics or sonnet forms, anything related to the Renaissance, um, impacts your work as black male poets in the 21st century. But maybe I could just start with what's up with the fairy queen? <laughs> <laughs> so I was, um, I just like, how, well, it, it doesn't feel this way when you have to teach it, but I, when I read The Fairy Queen, I just, I, I, the first time I read The Fairy Queen was in graduate school, um, and I just thought it was so easy. It's like, oh, there are good guys, there are bad guys, simple, like, the, everything means something. Do you know what I mean? And sometimes it can change meanings, yeah? Well, yeah, exactly. It yeah. shifts, it's wild, you know, it shifts, but I just like, I like the idea that you know, you know, in one of my poems, I have to tell my students this, um, teaching creative writing, teaching poetry workshops. When you put a door in a poem, it should just be a door. If it does, if, if it does other things, great. If people, you know, when you say road in a poem, people think journey. <laughs> Do y'all know what I mean? They only think that because it's in a poem. <laughs> When people tell you that they live on Delk Road, they just live on Delk Road. <laughs> Do y'all see what I mean? And so I really love that about that poem. And I, I always wondered if I could, um, I think often actually when I'm writing, I'm wondering how much I can push past what I tell my students. And the Fairy Queen seems to be something that breaks a lot of what I think of, the laws, think of as the laws of poetry. Uh, and so because it's breaking those laws, whenever I tell my students don't do this, I immediately find myself trying to see if I can do it, which I don't think that poem succeeds, but it was definitely the attempt at the beginning. I wanted everything to be a symbol rather than an image, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Do your students encounter the Fairy Queen in the way that you did? No, I mean, my students, I, I don't teach, I mean, I, I taught the Fairy Queen when I was at the University of San Diego, but at Emory I mostly teach, I don't teach literature classes, and so th they do see, they see- Shame, so, Emory, shame. shame but <laughs> They say, I don't mind teaching, <laughs> I don't want, um, but they do see, um, they do see Renaissance things, but more of the work they see is more contemporary. Yeah. Fred, what about for you? How, how, I love that you both picked your own poems independently and you both had Fairy Queen references. Oh no, I, I was, I hadn't really, decided to read that poem until Jericho said a fairy queen. And I was like, oh man, I got one too. So I'm just following behind him. <laughs> but, um, but I, uh, I mean, you know, I guess I read it first when I was in college, you know, in a big, you know, where I went to, you know, they call it English 10, you know, basically the, the Norton anthology class, you know, and, um, but I don't, I don't think it made that big of an impression on me then, but, um, but I had a good friend in graduate school who was really into Spencer and I was trying to read it just, you know, to try to be a friend, a good friend to him. And I, I still didn't really feel it that much, you know, but, um, but to tell you the truth, those, there's a few lines from it that I sort of just take, you know, at towards the end of that poem that came to me by way of the, uh, the, film version of Sense and Sensibility. And it's a line that, uh, I don't even remember the names of the characters, but the Alan Rickman reads it to Kate Winslet, you know, at the end of her long ordeal, you know, with Willoughby. I mean, I, I mix up the names of the actors with the names of the characters in the novel, but, but it's at this moment of repose when she, when that character uh, is ready to, to 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 be able to love Rickman's more quiet, less romantic, you know, but more actually a genuinely heroic character than than the sort of Byronic, you know, Willoughby. And uh and he reads it and you know, there was this scene earlier in the film when she was describing his reading as without soul, you know. But Rickman reads those lines so beautifully, you know, in that and I really heard those lines about, for there is nothing that may, may be, that may be found if sought, you know. And of course, I started trying to read it then, and I went, you know, went through the Fairy Queen and found those lines. And it comes along in a passage that is actually quite incomprehensible. <laughs> like the grammar of it, it, it really makes no sense. Um, that, that it creates this turmoil, this kind of intense tension between finding and, and seeking and losing. And you kind of know what Spencer means when he says it, but it's actually nonsense um, on a kind of grammatical level. And, and I love that, <laughs> you know, and I love that, that, that feeling of knowing something, knowing what a writer means, even when it makes no sense. And, and it actually, sorry to go on so long, but it, it's a, it's a particular discovery or it's a particular feeling, uh, that I learned to love through one of my teachers, the great, great Shakespeare scholar, Stephen Booth, uh, this, this interplay between, between knowing and nonsense, how it is that that what poetry produces or gives us sometimes is a kind of knowledge that can only emerge from what on a grammatical level is, is actually nonsensical, you know? Um, and and that, that particular thing is something that I'm just invested in and interested in. So, um, yeah. It's always interesting to me that, that poetry is the place that we think that is for. I mean, that happens in music lyrics, but music lyrics are like poetry. But it's, I think the thing that always, the thing that attracted me to poetry when I was a kid was that 
I understood what it was saying in spite of the fact that it didn't make sense. So the reason why, so I fell in love when I was a kid, I fell in love with Minnie Ripperton because the lyrics of that particular song are no one else can make me feel the colors that you bring. And I think that's crazy. But I think that it was clearly true. Like I wanted, like, you know, I was like 10. I was like, I gotta get that. <laughs> do you know what I mean? I'm like, what colors? <laughs> like, do you know what I'm saying? So I think um, I just wanted to agree with Fred in that moment. Yeah, with me, it was steep. As around the sun, the earth, though she's revolving. Like, I get that, but you could have said it a whole lot simpler, Stevie, yeah, yeah. except you couldn't have because you had to make it go with that music. Yeah, yeah. Or I James also, Brown, you know, I don't care about your thoughts. I just want to tell you about your faults. You know, <laughs> I don't care about your wants. I just want to tell you about your do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm mixing it all up. But cold sweat is like, you know, that was my first experience of language poetry, you know, yeah, like. It's interesting. Silliman never got to that, you know, Barrett White never got to that. Yes. So um, anyway, you yeah, know, on the same wavelength, <laughs> I think so. I also have a particular affinity for the line, look for the purple banana till they throw us in a truck. I don't even know what that is. It's Prince. <laughs> it's Prince? Look for the purple banana till they throw us in the truck. It's so good, right? Look for the purple banana till they throw us in the truck. It's the probably, truck. It's probably something very, very specific, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But not to anyone who's, who doesn't, yeah. It's let's go crazy. <laughs> it's like, this is you know what you don't crazy. Wanna, you know you don't want to get thrown up in that truck. <laughs> yeah, you don't want that truck. You don't want that truck. <laughs> Them people. <laughs> so Fred, I know that you've been teaching some Shakespeare courses. So, uh, yes, at NYU and Columbia, and I wonder, like, what's your, uh, what's your, your abstract for the class? What's your two or three sentence pitch for the way that you're teaching the students to approach Shakespeare? Um, well, well, I never taught at Columbia, but at NYU, I, I uh, the last, and, and, and also before I went to NYU, I was teaching this same class at UC Riverside. And I was really interested in, in, in the problem of sovereignty, you know, as a, as a political problem, you know, in the contemporary world. But, but one of the great books on the, the problem of sovereignty in sort of late medieval, early modern period, you know, is this book called The King's Two Bodies by um, Ernst Kantor Kantorowicz, which also turns out to be a book that, that the great poet Robert Duncan was really fascinated by and talked about and wrote about. And um, and so what I basically had been teaching the last couple of times I taught Shakespeare, you know, it's the, the, the four plays, you know, beginning with Richard II and ending with Henry V. And I'm just, I just love those plays. I think they're my favorite ones. I don't, I mean, I was talking with my friend P.A. Scanza, who your P. A. friend P.A. Scanza is in yeah. the room. She's waving yeah. to you, although you can't see her. <laughs> I'm waving at her, but I, I, uh, we were talking about the other day. I was like, I, the more I read it, the less I like Henry V, but the other three are amazing and to me. And, um, you know, and, and I just, and really, I, I'm interested in just reading those those plays as a as a kind of an attempt, you know, this brilliant attempt by Shakespeare, whoever that is or was, whoever they were, to uh, to both lay out a kind of exposition of the notion of sovereignty that is also at the same time. Uh, uh, an absolutely uh, 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 an absolutely undeniable, you know, obliteration of the idea of sovereignty at the same time. Um, so he sort of gives us a kind of modern conception of that notion and then takes it away from us at the same time. 
and um, with by way of this, you know, this continually deepening understanding of what it is to be a king that is inseparable from the, an equally deepening understanding of what it is to be an individual person through those plays. And so, so that's what we were trying to work on, you know, in the class. And, um, and it was, it's, it's, it was fun, you know, and um, I don't know if I'm ever going to do it again, but I was trying to catch up to, there's so much criticism that has been written over the last 10 or 12 years that I wasn't familiar with. And I just couldn't keep it up with it all. And I feel like I probably need to, that might be the last time for me. I just, it's not responsible for me to try to teach it anymore without keeping up with all this stuff. Shakespeare scholars are like a cancer. We just proliferate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jericho, do you teach any Shakespeare in your courses or, or any, um, or other early modern poetry? I teach um, the poems about the young man. Um, I have this, this moment in my class where I teach these poems uh, that seem to have been mistaught to, um, historically. I teach, I teach them along with some other poems, for instance, um, the Robert Frost poem, Road Not Taken. Uh, it seems to me that those poems are very directly queer poems. Uh, and I remember uh, the reason this class exists is because um, I was, uh, I thought when I was in high school and I was reading these poems for the first time, I thought I was in this relationship with a person who was much older than me. I, I was in high school, so I couldn't have been in a relationship. But anyway, um, but I remember seeing, because I'm a queer poem, seeing something in those poems that my teacher kept saying was not there. Um, and I think it's always been one of the, um, I don't know, something about the truth of poetry, the honesty of the poems, what the poems actually say, what, what we learn from the poems. If, if you know, people like to talk about poetry as bread, so what are you doing with that nutrition? Um, and how, you know, with Shakespeare, later with Whitman, Later, it seems to me with many of the poems of someone like Frost, there's always um, this glaze where, where we want to bring the poems into a classroom and then we want to tell you that they're not about what they say. Um, and I don't understand that exactly, but I remember getting you know, in a, a good amount of trouble because I was asking and when you're in high school and you're asking about the queer element of Shakespeare's poems, it looks like you're trying to make everybody in the class laugh. And I really just had a question. So I think, um, I think that has made this moment in my workshop where I bring these poems and we talk very directly about saying what you have to say. Um, and um, how it's possible for misreadings to happen. Uh, so I think that's when I usually am teaching Shakespeare. I think your experience is probably familiar to almost all the BIPOC folks in the room. <laughs> when you feel like you're reading a text and you're, you know something's in there, whether it be about race, class, gender, sexuality, or disability, and the, the u almost universal experience that I've heard from, from many of my colleagues of just being gaslit or- Yeah, to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, what's interesting to me is, other than attraction I had, I understood when I, I mean, I understood very young, but definitely high school was the moment that I understood that I was queer because I could see things that no matter, I mean, they said what they said, but nobody else in my classroom could see it. It's also when I began to understand that everyone else wasn't queer. Because I actually thought everybody was, since so many lies were around, I thought everybody could see that a man was fine. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't know it was just like me. Like I didn't know I had that special ability to see that a man was fine, you know what I mean? And I thought that, you know, you know, boys will say they are having sex when they are six years old. I hope they are lying. Do you know what I mean? So when 
when boys would act like they couldn't see a man was fine, I thought, oh, that's just, your li- we're supposed to act like we don't see that. And that, but I understood from the literature, from Shakespeare in particular, oh, they don't see it. I love that, like, queerness gives you a close reading ability. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's actually true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that Shakespeare, of, of course, is just late. It's, you don't have to read that closely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, well, in life, period, you see what people, what other people cannot or refuse, you know, refuse to see. Fred, I know you've had experiences like this. <laughs> <laughs> where you do when do you remember that you were reading things differently than everyone else I don't know I mean I don't know I don't think I've I don't know if I've I mean, I. <laughs> the audience is laughing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't think I've ever. I guess I don't think that I've. What I. I think that people have different experiences of reading. Have have. Ex, I think everybody has my sense of it, what I hope is true and what seems to be true based on my experience is that everybody has an experience of, 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 of reading deeply. And maybe we call deeply, may, deeply is probably not a good word. Differently is, we could say differently, we could say deeply, but even if we say deeply, I think generally what we mean is, is what we when we say that we see read deeply, it means that we see more of what's on the surface, <laughs> you know. Um, Two, it doesn't just mean uh, you get underneath something or you see stuff that's hidden from everybody else. No, you. It, it really is just a a matter of there's something that makes you want to pay close attention. There's something that makes you want to pay attention so closely that the that the gap between you and whatever you thought you were paying attention to starts to narrow, mm-hmm. starts to disappear. And all of a sudden you, you're, you're with what you're looking at rather than being against what you're looking at, you know? Um, and, it, and all of a sudden it's not an object anymore. And, and therefore you're not really a subject anymore in opposition to it, you, you're with it. You, and that kind of reading, I think, I, b- I believe that everybody has that. It's just that you have it by way of different things, you know? And I, you know, I'm, I, with me, I guess it's primarily, you know, with, in relation to books or maybe in relation to art, sometimes maybe music. The other people is in relation to cars or, or trees, plants. They, they garden, you know? They, 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 they see something in the dirt that I can't see. That I, that I'm not kind of programmed to see for whatever reason, but they see it, and um, and so I think it's just it it matters what what initially shows up for us as the object and then is no longer the object. That that's what it depends on, you know. But now the question is, is you know, how do we just in general learn how to respect all these different ways of reading closely, you know? And usually. You know, we're sort of lucky because the, the 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 ways we have of reading closely are, you know, tend to be sanctioned, you know, in the larger society in or in, in certain ways sometimes, you know. Um, but, you know, I know folks, man, who, you know, you know, you know, people who can, like my, my, my partner and her mother, it's funny eating dinner with them because they start, is that cardamom? You know, is that, you know, I don't, my taste buds are not that sensitive, but they, they talk about it like that. They, and it, and it's not, you know, and you might say, oh man, just shut up and eat. Just enjoy the food. No, I mean, that's part of their enjoyment of it. They, they're paying attention like that. You know, I don't, I don't have that, that thing. So 
Um, yeah, I, I don't. I guess, you know, maybe I'm just one of those folks who just don't want to be different, you know, so <laughs> I want to be like everybody else pretty much. So but so is. even if there's some shit that I do that's different, I kind of want to say, oh, no, everybody does that, I hope. You know, so. It is true, though, that um, sometimes you see things when you're reading that you know no one else can see or that people haven't seen, and you feel, I feel, you know this uh, Phyllis, the Phyllis Wheatley poem on being brought, um, I mean, ultimately at the end of that poem, she says, and I think this actually happens in every Phyllis Wheatley poem, I'm sorry, this is out of the era, I apologize. But in, like she says, there is no slavery in heaven and we will have to hang out together. And nobody white noticed her say it. They heard her say, oh, I'm so glad you made me a Christian because I'm going to get to go to heaven. <laughs> but when, what, she, what she really said was, with you. I'll be, I'll be, I'll, now that I'm a Christian, you can't get away from me. There is no, you, do you know what I mean? And I think that's something that I could see my whole life. You know, when I first saw that poem, I saw that and nobody else white saw that. I find that really interesting. I mean, and it's, I guess, what I love about reading. Like, I love that while I'm reading, I'm there. I'm like, oh, look, I'm here. And I'm, I'm a whole thing. <laughs> you know, I'm a person, you know, so. She, she's also, don't you think she's also saying that now that I'm a Christian, when we go to heaven, I, 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 I'm not going to be able to get away from you either. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is, yeah, yeah. You know. Definitely. Angelic train. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She says angelic train. Yeah, I think so. Do you want to, because I, I know the audience wants to ask questions and we will open it up to you in about one minute, but do you want to ask each other, since this is your first time in dialogue in public, is there a question that you want to ask the other person? I just want to know, you know, because the criticism gets mellifluous. Um, what is the, what is the process that is different for you? How do you know when you're working on what you're working on in terms of genre? Um, do you feel sometimes when you are writing theory and criticism that you are also making lines of poetry? Do you feel when you're writing poetry that you're also making lines of criticism in theory? Or do well, you not even think these things are different at all? Um, you know, I've been thinking about it a long time, but I, I don't, I still don't really know. But I, I know that there's sometimes when I know that I'm in the middle of writing, you know, an essay. See, I, I, I got, when I first started writing poetry, I was so... I really, there was this book by this guy named, uh, oh man, I can't think of his first, John Hollander. He was an old uh, critic taught at Yale for many years. He wrote this book called Rhymes Reason. It was a little book, you know, and it kind of had little examples of Sestin, you know, y'all probably know that book. And, um, and I really got, it was something about sonnets that really attracted me. So I think I wrote like, Man, I probably wrote like thousands of sonnets, you know, and um, and it, it got to a point where I was almost thinking in iambic pentameter, and and there's definitely moments in criticism that I write that can be scanned, but it's you know it looks like prose, it is, but in my but it's definitely that way, and um, and then so I think the line is real blurry, you know, and um. And then at the same time, over the course of time, there are moments in the poetry that have become way more discursive, way more sort of argumentative, you know, mm -hmm. in a way. So I think I still kind of feel like I want to insist on the difference between the two. Um, 
I definitely also at the same time want to say that that the criticism can and should have some music to it. And then I also want to say that the poetry is always for me a form of criticism because it's usually in response to something that somebody said or somebody wrote, you know. But um, for instance, um, and this will be my question for you, um, and now, <laughs> um, which is both this common phrase that folks like us, you know, Black folks with Southern roots, that phrase is fundamental for us, you know? And then at the same time, reading your poem, uh, it was made new to me again too, you know? And, uh, and I just love, really I wanna, the question I have is, you know, what is it that, when did you hear it? When did you hear it? How did you hear it when you knew, when it, when it became something that you had to, it had to be re, re-spoken in the poem that way? When, because I heard it through you, you know, when, when, and them became something for me that, that I had to speak myself differently by way of you. But, but what, when did you hear it? I mean, you sort of tell that story a little bit in the poem too, but but it's not all in that poem, you know. So, when I was um, growing up and learning poetry, when I was in college, graduate school, um, whenever I would be in a class um, in high school, whenever I was in a class that was poetry or literature in particular, there was a moment at which you studied the black writers. And you usually did it all in a day or all in a week or whatever. And um, the wonderful thing about that is what happens at all those other moments are either differences in era or differences in aesthetic. So when I learned the language poets, for instance, I didn't learn, oh, here are these white poets in, do you know what I like, It wasn't, it was, oh, this is an aesthetic. Do you know what I mean? Um, but when I learned Bob Kaufman, I learned him the same day or week that I learned Langston Hughes um, and Wanda Coleman and Jane Cortez. Every time, County yeah, County Color. Every time it was time to talk about black people, you talked about them all in the same, you know, sometimes it would be a few weeks. You know, if you got a good teacher, it's a few weeks. Um, and so, and, and when that would happen, I, I thought very, because that would happen, I thought very well of black people. Because I was like, oh, they can write anything. They can write anyway. Do you, know, do you know what I mean? Like, I just was like, oh, black people don't have, black people write everything, every way, all over time. Do you know what I mean? And one of the things that I saw in that, that I always, I, really, I literally prayed for, um, was this ability, I, I remember reading into Zaki Shange and thinking, oh, she sounds like a person that I know. Do you know what I mean? Um, or Lucille Clifton thinking, oh, she sounds like somebody who's like, she sounds like somebody who's read the Bible, but I know them. Do you know what I'm saying? So I really wanted, I think from the beginning, I wanted to insinuate myself in the poems. And so I'm always thinking uh, sort of outside of myself, looking at myself, what do I say? How do I sound? How do I talk when I talk to my family? Um, you know, uh, today y'all were making fun of me because they Fred, were making, Fred, Fred, you, Fred, they were making fun it. of me because obviously I can't say the word modern <laughs> without making the O happen for a very long time. Um, and so I was the, what I was really thinking was how can I get that in a poem? When y'all were saying this, I'm like, there's no way, how do I, you know, and so in my head, so this, you know, Nate Marshall came out with this book called Finna, and I wanted to kill him because he beat me to it. And it's sort of like the goal of my work. I want to say Finna in poems. I want to say Nim 
in poems. Um, and I, somehow or another, I feel that um, if I do that, then I'm really writing my poems. I'm not trying to write what people think are poems. Um, and I can make what I've been trying to make, which is all that black poetry that can do anything. I can make that one of the any things that it can do. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I, I just want to ask one last question, then it's open to the audience. But and then how does how does form fit into that? Because I understand. I think I understand what you're saying about your voice and the and vernacular. Um, how does form? I mean, it's different depending on the poem. When I'm writing, I notice that I've written a line or some lines of blank verse, and then I say, pay attention, Jericho, you might be writing a sonnet, or you might be writing something in blank verse. Do you know what I mean? And if I write three lines of blank verse, and I didn't do it on purpose, the rest of the lines are on purpose. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm like, oh, that's what I'm doing? OK. Or if I see that I make, if I, I, I notice that I'm repeating a line because I know what a villanelle is, I know what a pantoum is, I might push in that direction. I wouldn't sit down to write a sonnet. I end up with sonnets because I know what sonnets are. Uh, because I know that a sonnet exists, I write something that's A, B, A, B, and I think, oh, let's see if I can do CD, CD. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? So That's great. Fred, how about you? How does form come in for you? Um, well, I mean, um, I guess, uh, I don't know. I, I never really, um, you know, after that kind of initial period, you know, maybe in high school, not even in high school, it was actually the year I was home when I flunked out of college and I was reading that Hollander book and, you know, and I guess there was the constraint, you know, that was good for me, you know, like I felt like, okay, I'm going through some exercises here and I probably felt like maybe, you know, I need a little discipline, you know, it was like playing a game, you know, um, but, but then and it was it was fun, you know, and it was different from my earlier experiences of poetry, because my initial experiences of poetry were, you know, just the speech of the people in, in my neighborhood and in my house. And then also, you know, back when they used to have, you know, record albums and, you know, it was, you know, the liner, you know, the, the, the lyrics to what's going on to inner visions to, uh, you know, Rastamon vibrations, those, that was poetry. That was the first, you know, I was like, oh, this, this is words on a page that look like, you know, and, uh, you know, my mom had certain books, you know, so I felt like, I, I felt like, you know, I knew who Marie Evans was before I knew who Milton was. And so, so reading the, the English stuff and stuff in college, that was, it felt interesting and exotic to me, <laughs> you know. It's, and 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 I was like, okay, well they they're doing these tricks. I'm gonna see if I can learn how to do these tricks. And once I felt, once I got tired of doing those tricks, then the stuff that felt more natural to me were were poets who felt like to me were on my initial reading of them. It felt like they were destroying form. That they were breaking form. And then in my um, maybe second reading, it's like, no, they're not they're not only breaking already existing form, but they're making new form. And and sometimes that's occurring from poem to poem, you know, so that the poem itself becomes an occasion to make a new form, you know, and, and it is both, you know, at the level of, you know, the line and syntax and all that and rhyme, if, if you want to do that, but also visually, you know, how you want to make certain kinds of patterns, you know, that are visual on the page. So, so I kind of feel like at this stage, I'm still caught up in that moment of just this, this interplay between breaking and making, you know, and, um, 
and and then you sort of find it, you know, as you go. So. I love that. The interplay between breaking and making. It's brilliant. All right. With that, let's open it up to the audience. Please raise your hand and wait for a microphone for accessibility issues. Oh, oh they're taking my microphone. <laughs> And uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, say a thing about uh, form just to follow uh, what Fred said um, because you asked. I was also attracted to black people's use of received forms in particular, um, partially, I mean, well, maybe not just partially, but I understood, I mean, in Claude McCain, I have um, an introduction to um, Har to um, Harlem Shadows, a Claude McKay book that I love so much. But you know, when Claude McKay makes use of form, when he writes a sonnet, almost every sonnet he write, ha writes has the word hate in it because he understood sonnets were love poems and he also understood that he was black. And so it was always with, with McKay, with Cullen, with so many poets making use of formal, f of, of received forms, um, it was always an opportunity to be subversive. And it was also a direct, I mean, Langston Hughes is different, it seems to me, because he doesn't ever really seem to me to necessarily be talking with the idea that white people can hear him. Whereas Carl McCain and County McCullen are letting white people have it left and right. They're like, white people, white people. Do you know what I mean? And I, I think I noticed that difference early on. So there was something that was suggesting, even in those poems, that received forms were about white people. And, uh, and what they wanted to do was own them for themselves. Like, oh, look what I can do. do, you, do you, which is necessary when people think you could never learn to read. You know what I mean? So um, I think that was another attraction to, to received forms. For me, I felt like I was doing something that had already been laid down in the tradition. Questions? They don't have no questions. We got it's one. okay. I just hope y'all don't take no money out of my check. <laughs> if they don't have any questions, don't, don't get the deducting. Just because they didn't have any questions, I did what I was supposed to do. This question, hi, I'm Mimi, by the way. I'm a, a fourth year PhD student in justice studies. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, this question is for uh, Dr. Fred Bowden, but it's kind of, I'm also uh, the vice president of the Black Graduate Student Association here at ASU, and I'm also a member of the Multicultural Solidarity Coalition here. And like we've been doing a lot of like university organizing. I, I was on the Lyft Initiative um, Council here at ASU. So I kind of just have a question and you can answer this as well too. Um, about, you know, of course, the undercommons and <laughs> just like the poetics behind being in but not of the university. And um, just revisiting that, that possibility and like how it impacts the body, especially black bodies here in the university, and its relation to to your um, to your your the affirmation you kind of made that I kind of go back to a lot when you were in your talk with Sadia Hartman at Duke, and you said "fuck the human." So, what's the relationship between like "fuck the human" being in but not of the university, and like the poetics to how we get there, and like what what makes that like kind of a an art and a poetry? of its own, since that was a big question, you can answer whatever parts of it you're comfortable with, but yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's thank you very much for the question. Um, you, you have to email me, um, <laughs> or you can get my phone number from uh, from Mayana or from PA and L, because that's that take us a couple hours to <laughs> talk about and, and uh, 
and then I want to hear more about your experience there, you know, too. And I imagine it's like most questions like that, you you probably already have the answer. But, um, well, you know, again, growing up black and either in the South or with people who were from the South, that phrase, I, I'm sure Jericho's heard it, I, I ought to, you know, being in, you know, you got to be in the world, but not of it, you know. And you got to understand that most of the time when 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 I heard people say it, it's a phrase that you always have to take with a grain of salt. Um, most of the time, the people who said it were the most worldly people you could ever imagine. And they always were trying to say it as a way of dogging the folks who they thought were doing something that, that they didn't have any business doing. Um, and so I think it's one of those moments in the undercommons where Stefano and I probably needed to say a little bit more than what we actually said. Um, there's a there's a beautiful impulse, I think, behind this notion that you can be in the world and not of it. Um, but it's also a problematic impulse, and the impulse is problematic because it's really a, an impulse to say that that I, as an individual, can somehow transcend all the nastiness of the world. And 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 what we were really trying to do in that moment, in that part of that essay, was to say there are many good left intellectuals who really truly believe that that they have the the moral wherewithal in their own individual subjectivities to somehow transcend the nastiness of the university. But that's always an illusory dream. And it usually ends in a kind of hyperjudgmental nastiness, hyperjudgmental, hypercritical nastiness, which is almost always visited upon left intellectuals, right? And it's one of the reasons why it can be sometimes so unpleasant to be in a university, particularly because you're sitting around arguing all the time with people who you agree with on 99% of the shit you talk about, right? And we spend very little time trying to kick the ass of the people who are trying to kill us because we spend so much time sniping at each other when we agree. So, but we don't want to disavow that would be subversive intellectual. What we want to do is we want to say that we need to replace the dream of the individual subversive intellectual with the reality of a common socialized subversive intellectuality that we do together. Right. Not because you're some morally pure individual who rises above it all, but because we're all nasty and we're all in the muck, just like Zora Neale Hurston teaches us. And we ought to want to be in the muck because that's where we can be together. So um, but we didn't really say that last part as clearly as we should have. And I think sometimes folks think, oh, well, we need to achieve this dream of being the subversive intellectual. It's like, no. What we need to do is work together to 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 produce a genuinely common social collective subversive intellectuality. And that's what black study is or should be. But and and I believe that that's what black poetry has always been. That's what black music is. So all we were really doing was just trying to. To be like the people that we've been studying, you know, um, that's that's all we're trying to do is is be like the black folks we study and be like the black folks who raised us um, and who taught us how to live, you know, in the world. Fred, you're getting an applause. I think you don't think he can hear it. I don't know. Can you hear the applause? They were clapping the whole time you were talking. I couldn't hear what you were saying. They were so excited. <laughs> I'm like, how y'all clapping for him if you can't hear him? <laughs> they really liked it, though. I liked it, too. It actually explained, I really, I feel like I learned a lot from that answer that I did not know before. I appreciate it. All right, uh, we're a little over time, but I think we're gonna take one more question. Okay. Hi, um, I'm one of the white teachers that teaches <laughs> the poetics in the wrong way. Um, Welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, you're not, you're not 
<laughs> but what I want to say is I was today years old when I've taught Robert Frost years and years and years and never knew to look at the poem in that way because our experience has pushed us into that tunnel. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my question is, what advice would you give uh, people who want to be more inclusive and are teaching classic poet poetry in a very narrow way and want to kind of branch out and be more inclusive to my students' uh, experience? Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know if it's advice, uh, but I, I do know that, I mean, there are a few things, there are a lot of things that we, um, we do and then we act like that's not real life. And I don't know what the advice is to get us, you know, like, I, no shade, like I know we're not talking about this, I apologize. But people who are like, I don't know, outlawing abortion, for instance, like, it's actually kind of, I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, everybody knows better. Like, everybody literally knows better. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I think you have to, um, I, I mean, I don't know how you teach this other than life, but I think you have to be okay with feelings and sitting in feelings without reacting with violence to other people. I don't know, I mean, if I knew how to teach that, you know, we wouldn't have America. Um, so, I mean, what happens, what happens with Shakespeare, what happens with Whitman, what happens with Frost, what, what happens with Dickinson is, the poems get to someone and they need to, they feel the need to purify the poems because the poems are the way our lives often are, dark and sad. I mean, Frost is dreary. I don't know why anybody thought they were gonna, I mean, I guess it worked, you know, turning Frost into like this, this sort of like inspirational poet. I don't, I mean, I don't know why. I mean, I, and I guess that's the goal because I want my kids to read poems, but I don't want them to be sad. It's like, well then, give up on poetry, baby. Do you know what I mean? I, I, and part of um, what I think about poems is that poems are indeed full of, of joy, just as much as they are full of darkness, because they are and should be like us. We walk, I mean, I don't know how y'all are living y'all's lives, but my ancestors sang while they were picking cotton that they had to pick with no choice. And they were singing down. They were perfecting singing. Do you know what I'm saying? I know it, I know it because my mother, my mother was picking cotton. It's not that far away. My mom picked cotton. And all of her sisters and brothers, I mean, from the time that they had fingers that really could do something, they were put in a position to pick cotton. My mama sings her face off. Y'all ought to hear her. Do you know what I mean? And she is happy when she's singing. Do you know what I'm saying? So I just think um, you have to have you have to have some idea of Duende or some idea of blues or some idea of understanding that the human condition includes, you know, walking from one place to the other and holding a bunch of emotions at the same time, a bunch of supposedly contradictory or conflicting emotions at the same time, which is what a poem is. So when you teach a poem, this is why we have all these horrible movies, right? Every movie's got a, you know, I was just, um, I host this podcast about Emily Dickinson, and um, we had a writer named Chin Chin, and he's, he, re, he has these poems about his mom. He doesn't have the best relationship with his mom. And he said the thing he hates most is after he reads the poem, people raise their hand and they ask him, how are things with him and his mom? Because people need a happy ending. 
And I always, and I, I told him on the show, I said, you should tell him you killed her. <laughs> just tell him you murdered her and see what happens. Because everybody needs to know, oh, but everything's okay or with you. Or that he didn't have a mother. Yeah, it's like this, everybody, we're trained up for this happy ending, this inspirational moment, this celebratory poem. You know, um, won't you celebrate with me? Everything after that in that poem is negative. Even the last line, y'all get all excited about. The last line of that poem is what? Um, every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. What's so good about that? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> failed is not a positive word. Do you, do you understand what I mean? So you have, to, you have to be willing to feel the emotions that come with being a person. And you have to allow your students to feel those emotions and if I think that if they actually have a training in feeling emotions, then when they do feel emotions, they don't feel like they need to shoot every damn body. If we're training people to be numb, when they are confronted with emotion that does not allow for their numbness, they want to kill whatever made the emotion happen because they never... They never felt anything. Everybody's telling you not to feel anything. Don't be a man. Don't be a man, oh, because you will not feel a thing. Do you know what I mean? So I just, um, is, that's the best I can give. Because you know, that poem, at the end of that poem, that's, I love the way he uses form at the end of that poem. He says, um, I, I, it follows when he says, Sigh, I shall be telling this with a sigh, ages and ages hence. This does not sound good. I don't know where y'all get that happy. Two roads in a wood and I, I left the one that's trapped. Like, it's not a good story. You're not, do you know what I mean? So, and I think um, we're doing that with many, my, this happens with my poems. You know, people want to feel good at the end of the poem, so they decide to give the poem a re an entire reading that leads to the feel goodness. You know, and they're welcome to it, but it's just not real life. And poems are there, music, art in general, really good art, is there for us to participate. You know, the difference between Barry Jenkins and Tyler Perry, right? You know, if you go see you know, I don't have a problem with Tyler Perry. I mean, he's delusional, but I don't have a problem with him. I don't mind, I love delusional people. They're always fun, always. I don't know a delusional person that's not a good time. Um, you know, if you go see Madea goes to jail or Madea does whatever Madea does, you, you don't have to do anything but laugh. Everything up there on the screen happens to you and you react with laughter. And that's why you go see him. If you go see Moonlight, you have to participate. I had to see it 73 times. I, I spent so much money watching Moonlight and then they put it on HBO. You know, I, you know, I had to see it because every time I saw it, I saw something I didn't see before. I thought about something I hadn't thought before. And if you want to teach poems, you want to allow for that. You can't shut emotion down and say every, at the end of every story is, you know, the gift of the Magi. Everybody wants to at the end of every story to be the gift of the Magi. Anyway, so that's, I guess, my advice. I hope that helped. I cannot thank you both enough. Fred, we wish you well. We want you to have a speedy recovery and to get your ass to Arizona at some point so we can hang out in person. Um, thank you so much for your wisdom, your thought, your inspiration. Thank you, Jericho. There is a book signing. Fred, is Jericho signing your books? If, if, if you'll do me the favor and the honor, I appreciate it. <laughs> Can I tell y'all this thing is so, I think it's funny. 
So I, I got, before my Angelou died, I got to see her in a pro, at a program honoring Toni Morrison. We all, um, Rita, do you remember this? We all read our favorite Toni Morrison paragraph. I was so honored. I read the first paragraph of The Bluest Style. I'll never forget. I had memorized the thing and everything. Um, and my Angelou gets up, and rather than read a Toni Morrison paragraph, she said, you know, um, people, you know, I'm black, so people think black people look alike. And she said, people always bring me books to sign, and sometimes they bring me Toni Morrison books. <laughs> And she said, and I just sign on. <laughs> that's all. I think that's so funny. So, on so that I'm going to sign your books, Fred, <laughs> in, for, in honor of my Angelou. <laughs> thank you both, and thank you, audience.